to come into. Thank you for um, thanks for organising that. I think Grange Hill. Is it? Yeah, good, good East London School. Hi, so I'm Natasha Porter. Um, I am a. I'll give you a bit of my background. So I trained with Teach First to become a teacher in 2006. Um, in 2009, I started a school with some of my Teach First friends uh, in um, a, the most deprived area of London. So uh, my Teach First school was also a Hackney Overspill school. So taught in disadvantaged, challenging schools and challenging communities. And the school which we started um, became very successful academically. We took a model across from the States, which, which was very successful. Um, and after that, I went into the think tank world, did a bit of advising at DfE. And earlier last year, Sally Coates, who I knew from schools, um, got in touch to ask if I could help with the uh, prison education review. And I discovered the world of prisons last year. And um, it's been an extraordinary discovery uh, to, to see what happens, but also meeting lots of officers, seeing the great work you do and seeing how similar a lot of it is to teaching has been really interesting. So I'm not going to talk about officers today. I'm going to talk about inspirational teachers and, um, and a little bit about how we find them and how we can build them and what it means to be an inspirational teacher. There's a myth that inspirational teaching is a natural ability that people either have or they haven't got. And it's widely believed throughout society. All of these well-known inspirational teachers from the big screen follow the stories of teachers that have broken the mould and bucked against the system to become inspiring. We didn't watch them go through their teacher training, but it seems unlikely that Michelle Pfeiffer was told in her PGCE to challenge kids to a fight in order to get their respect, or to teach them about drug references and pop music from the 70s to develop poetry appreciation. The idea that inspirational teachers buck against their system and follow their instincts is part of what's perpetuated the mythology that teaching is something you either can do or you can't do, and that great teachers are born rather than made. The myth of the naturally inspiring teachers is also perpetuated by teachers themselves. When you ask the best teachers what it is that makes them so good at their job, they often struggle to identify the exact thing that makes them so good. Like with children who can do complex mathematical sums in their heads or start to play any new instrument which they pick up immediately, society has a narrative that great teaching is a skill which cannot be taught or learnt. But there's another theory which is much more based in evidence to explain why great teachers can't describe what makes them inspirational. It comes from a phrase used by psychologists to describe great sportsmen who can't explain where their talent originates from. Expert-induced amnesia is when you've practiced and developed something so frequently over such an extended period of time that skill is encoded in your memory. You no longer think about the action when you're doing it. Whereas novices consciously think about their actions as they carry them out, experts carry them out without any conscious thought. An example of this might be if, if any of you drive a manual car. Um, an unconscious expertise skill is when you're able to hold the car still or move incrementally in traffic just using the accelerator and the clutch pedal. You don't actively think about what you're doing. It feels natural, but that is something that can be taught, obviously, and can be learned. So just because expert teachers can't explain what makes them expert, it doesn't mean they've been born with the ability to be a great teacher. Teachers become inspirational and great through repeated practice. That said, there are definite character traits which help when you're teaching a particular group of students. When I was teaching in inner city state schools, secondary schools for almost a decade, I would have struggled to survive if I wasn't able to separate my emotional responses from my professional self, if I didn't have the resilience to keep going back after a tough day. Tough day. Um, I deliberately never found out how to call in sick to make sure that I didn't in those early days, and the ongoing desire to be a better teacher and create better outcomes for my students. So where are these inspirational teachers and how can we find them? There are outstanding schools and teachers who are closing the gap across the country, but our data doesn't track individual classes or teachers. And there's such infrequent nationalised testing in the UK, the best teachers are really hard for researchers to find. We're beginning to find ways to identify outlier schools in the UK, however, and these do house many inspirational teachers. However, there are still many, many other outlier teachers who are hidden and need to be identified. This graph was shown to me um, repeatedly through my teaching and, and it's, it's better than it was when I started teaching, but it's still, I think, quite, um, 
quite a worrying graph. It shows the percentage at the bottom of pupils who live in the most disadvantaged households, tracked against the proportion achieving the national benchmark of 5A star to C at GCSE with English and maths. There's a couple of really interesting points here. Every dot represents a secondary school in England. The first is the line of best fit, which goes through the graph, that, that thick black line. It shows that academic attainment of a school correlates with how wealthy students' parents are who go to that school. The cluster of dots in the green area, over to the top corner, is where every child's passing their GCSEs. And what you can see is those are also the schools with the fewest children living in poverty. What's most interesting about this graph is that one school in the red area. This is a school which has 80% of their students living in poverty, but almost 100% are passing their GCSEs. So this is a school which bucks the trend. It's a real outlier school. If we want to start to identify where our outlier teachers are, that school is going to be a good place to start to hunt them down. Some parts of America have benefited have the benefit of data which is linked to individual teachers and this makes these teachers easier to find. The first teacher I want to tell you about was found in 2010 in Los Angeles. There's a bit of a story to it. The LA Times used a freedom of information request to get performance data on every teacher in Los Angeles. The local district was collecting it but they never meant to make it public. LA Times found out about it, put in a freedom of information request, got the data. They then published the data, it listed every single teacher in LA and it, they ranked them from the, by their effectiveness and it had a seven year period. So they looked at the value add, which was how much teachers added to the value of the people from when they came in. And what they did was they found the best teachers were making double the amount of, of progress than the average. So kids in their class make two years of progress in a single year. At the very top of this list was a woman from LA, there she is, called Zenaida Tan. Zenaida taught in an ordinary school, Morningside Elementary, it had higher than average kids from deprived backgrounds. Children typically came to her class below average in English and maths. They left a year later above average. Simply put, she changed children's tra trajectories. They went from being behind their peers to being ahead of them. As part of the story, the LA Times sent someone to interview her and take this photo. She said nobody in her entire career had ever told her she was a strong teacher. She had an evaluation from the principal every year where he told her how she was getting on. Her most recent evaluation, she got satisfactory in every measure. The only comment she got was that she'd been late three times to pick up her kids from recess. The head teacher of her school had the highest performing teacher in the entire district in his school, and he had no idea what she was doing or that she was there. Neither did her colleagues. They described her as strict and a bit mean. For seven consecutive years, she'd been transforming children's life chances, and it had never been recognised. Not one of her colleagues had even identified her successes, and no one was learning from her. So Nader explained what made her teaching special. She sets high expectations. She builds classroom culture around academic success. She starts her day with really hard maths problems. She calls them monster maths. Fun. She sets these as challenges. She, she supports her kids to reach the answers and celebrates when they do. She's an extrovert. Her lessons are full of song and games. She also comes from a similar background from the kids and she talks about that to build rapport with them. Sounds just like we might expect from a great teacher in terms of her personal characteristics. She's strict, but a lot of fun. A bit like Michelle Pfeiffer in Dangerous Minds, if any of you have ever seen it. Um, what's been extraordinary tracking these incredible teachers though is actually not all of them have her characteristics. They share very few external characteristics. Inspirational teachers have all kinds of personalities. The next example is a young math teacher from Boston. He's another inspirational outlier as he had the highest value add in his whole state for maths. Um, he, he worked in a really challenging school, high proportion of disadvantaged students. Jay Altman, this guy, went to talk to him about how he did it. Was it chanting, rapping times tables? Some schools really enjoy that. Uh, fun games to embed learning. Surprisingly, it was much less charismatic than that. The teacher read the curriculum thoroughly at the start of every year, mapped each skill to each lesson that he was teaching. At the start of every lesson, he showed the kids how to do the maths question, then gave them loads of examples, and at the end of the lesson, they do a quiz. If they didn't get 100% on the quiz, they'd have to come back same day after school. The teacher would reteach the skill, students would redo examples, and then they would retest. If they didn't get 100%, they'd carry on. When it came to supper time, if they hadn't got 100% yet, he'd take them to McDonald's. He'd carry on teaching them, carry on testing them. Sometimes they'd be with him until late at night, but he would not let them go home until they got 100% in that quiz. Every single one of his students nailed that curriculum. 
And at the end of the year, they were the highest performing students in maths in the state. Um, he's not an extroverted system. He's not a teacher. He's not bucking against the system. He's not making lessons crazily fun with games. But I think he's every bit as inspirational as Zenaida Tan. His story might not be a great Hollywood movie. You might not go and watch him, you know, redoing that test. But what I guess my point is that an inspirational teacher doesn't necessarily have a particular personality type. They don't even have to share the same background as their students. They just have to transform the outcomes of where their students live. There are some characteristics which make an uninspiring teacher. Someone who hates children, someone who doesn't like challenge. Um, they do sometimes end up in the classroom and they tend not to last too long. And if they do, they're not very happy. Uh, someone who finds the content they're teaching boring, probably less good um, and probably better in another career. But there are commonalities which all inspiring teachers share. They expect more from their students, even than their students believe they can give. They don't let anyone fall between the gap. They fight outcomes being determined for external, by external events. They have strict rules. They implement them fairly and equally, but from a place of love and care rather than power. They have structures and routines which make their classes feel distinctive and special. But the one thing which matters most is inspiring teachers are those who constantly aspire to be inspirational, and they continuously work at improving their practice. The most exciting discovery from teacher development over recent years is this. It's possible to learn to be an inspirational teacher. There's a guy called Doug Lamov. He's a chief executive of an extraordinary chain of schools serving at a private community in New Jersey. He spent the last 10 years observing the highest performing teachers, and he codified what they do into 62 techniques. He created short videos showing expert teachers delivering these techniques so all teachers could learn great teaching practice from them. What I found extraordinary from this, as an experienced teacher when I came across it, was not only that it taught me some new ideas, but also that a lot of them I already did, but it gave me a name for them. And that meant I was able to utilize them much better and improve my use of them. Most excitingly, these skills can be learned by any open-minded and willing teacher. So the first step to becoming an inspirational teacher is to become willing to continue learning and bettering your practice. This also applies to teachers who are already inspirational. Thinking you've mastered your craft is the first step back to being uninspiring and mediocre. Once teachers decided they want to become better, they need to identify other teachers who are doing what's working. Through observation and reflection, they need to watch it and learn from it. They then need to practice on breaking down their skills with a mentor, just as a great sports person does with a coach. Following this process throughout their career means any teacher can become inspirational. So I'm gonna talk you through a few of Doug Lamov's techniques. Um, we don't have much time and this is gonna be a real whistle stop tour. It's worth noting that a teacher would focus on one of these for at least a week, which would be about 25 hours of practice um, up to you know, maybe half a term. So it's gonna be very quick, but I'll, just, I'll talk you through them because I think they're quite interesting. The first technique I'm gonna talk through is great for teachers who need to normalize compliance from their students. Narrate the positive builds a classroom culture where students feel following your instructions is normal and the best option. It's really good with new teachers and rowdy classes. The purpose of this technique is to never draw your class's attention to any students who don't follow your instructions, as this will make the rest of the kids consider joining in. Let's take an example. The teachers ask students to start a writing task. About a quarter of the class are just ignoring their instructions. They haven't started writing yet. If a teacher says, 25% of you haven't started writing, it's not good enough. The 75% who have started writing suddenly realise a quarter of their classmate aren't bothering and some of them will start to follow suit. They'll think, why am I bothering to write if so many of my peers aren't? Soon the teacher can lose the whole class. By saying 99% of us are writing, we're almost all there. It's not completely factually accurate. But those who aren't writing will feel like they're in a small minority, like they're standing out a bit, and they will begin to change their behaviour and start writing. The majority of people follow the crowd. If you narrate what you want your crowd to be doing, you'll see that most begin to follow suit. I was told in my first few months of teaching, someone always needs to be in charge. If it's not you, it will be one of the students. A teacher who constantly narrates that they're in charge reminds the students that they don't have to take over. Assume the best is also about narrating a message of compliance, even when a student does, um, even if a teacher singles students out for non-compliance. This is a powerful tool because students and most people don't want to lower people's expectations of them. Instead of 
uh, me saying, Radvan, I told you not to start, you're not listening to me, which shows all the students that not listening to my instructions is an option and that I'm beginning to lose control. If I say, Radvan, you must have missed me asking you not to start yet, could you wait for my instructions, please? It gives the impression that no one would willingly ignore my instructions, which again reinforces my authority with the class. Even better is, Radvan, I know you're really excited to make a start, just put your pen down until I finish giving instructions. When behaviour does need correcting, sometimes the best thing to do is depersonalise the correction. Saying to a child, you're rude, is less likely to change their behaviour than saying your behaviour is rude, which acknowledges their behaviour is separate from them and therefore something they're able to change. Even better is a phrase which assumes the best and shows care. It's unlike you to behave so rudely. Please fix it immediately. Another technique which I really like is called purpose, not power. This can be really effective. It's about framing behaviour correction in language that focuses on achievement and self-discipline for students, rather than on reinforcing your own power as an authority figure. If I say, you need to be on time because I say so, it says more about my own authority complex than about the purpose of the rule that I'm trying to implement. A correction which in Stesnet says, you need to be on time, you need to learn to be on time because if you're late as an adult, it's gonna cost you your job or you need to be on time so you don't miss out on your learning. Focus on the purpose of using my authority, which helps the student learn more. I'm just gonna rush through because I'm flashing red, but um, us and them is essentially about building a culture, using nicknames, creating mythology, talking about shared experiences. It's also a way of building up self-esteem of students by, by giving roles and responsibilities. These techniques might sound really simple, but utilised well, they completely transform classroom culture, especially in really disadvantaged and challenging schools. Um, where teachers and students work together towards a common goal, you end up with a lot better ethos. So what can inspirational teachers achieve? This graph, uh, it shows, it's evidence what happens with poverty and how it still determines academic outcomes. So what it shows is from 22 months, just before they're two years old, until 10 years old, and it's four children at the beginning, two in the top 10th percentile for IQ, two in the bottom, identical IQ, but different socioeconomic backgrounds. What you can see is at just over three years old, already a gap is starting just based on socioeconomic status. By the age of six or seven, the child who's in the bottom 10th percentile but comes from a wealthier family overtakes the child in the top 10th percentile from the deprived background. By the age of 10, which are the tests which mark the end of primary school, children's academic outcomes aren't determined by cognitive ability, but by parental wealth. This continues throughout secondary school. It worsens at GCSE, A-level, and university access and completion. Children who come from less wealthy backgrounds are no less intelligent. They have no less potential. This gap is the thing which inspirational teachers can fix. Oh, little arrows. Um, this is what happens when you've got an inspirational teacher. The red light, so you can see the, the disadvantaged student with a poor teacher in the bottom 10th percentile only makes six months of progress, half a year in a, in a year of schooling. Whereas if they've got the inspirational teacher, top 10th percentile, they make a year and a half of progress in a year of schooling. So that means if you have um, an inspirational teacher for two years, then you can make three years of progress when the rest of your peers are making two. So that completely closes the gap of disadvantage for children. And this shows uh, reading age, what happens if you have a really inspirational teacher, the green line versus the blue, which is national average, and a poor teacher for a disadvantaged child, the red line, leaving primary school with a reading age of eight. And that's what happens later on. Those red schools are schools which are beginning to change that gap. So those are schools where inspirational teachers are actually able to completely change the trajectory of children who go there. This is the quote I put up at the start, and I'm just going to finish on this. It comes from a report which McKinsey and Co. released in the early 2000s on what improves education at a system level. They found that governments tried changing funding levels, buildings, class sizes, governance, curriculum, assessment, admissions, many other aspects. The only difference, the thing that made a difference to children's attainment was the quality of their teachers. And what's really exciting about this, and I hope I've shown you, is that teachers who want to become high-quality inspirational teachers can become that. Thanks. <laughs>